We have made it to the end of our trip through the Minor Prophets. It's time to look back at the pictures. And I've arranged these snapshots from the Minor Prophets into several photo albums for us to enjoy together. Here's the first one, is the Minor Prophets lineup that we used for the skit. Hosea is the one who God used his family as an object lesson of God's sin, I'm sorry, of Israel's sin and God's forgiveness of Israel's sin. Joel is the one that God gave messages about grasshoppers and swarming armies coming on the day of the Lord. Amos is the shepherd from Judah who preached to Israel until he got kicked out. Obadiah gave a short message about the Edomites' judgment coming on the day of the Lord. Jonah, the grumpiest, yes, most successful prophet to Nineveh, his message saved them, and boy, was he mad about it. <laughs> Micah said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and would shepherd God's people, both of which are like David. Nahum preached destruction for Nineveh and got what he preached for. Habakkuk asked God a lot of questions, mostly about God's justice. Zephaniah was King Josiah's cousin, and he preached judgment and salvation for the whole world. And Haggai helped get the people to rebuild the temple after the exile, and also helped to get the people to rebuild the temple. Sorry, Zechariah also helped get the people to rebuild the temple, and he had visions that are paralleled in Revelation. And Malachi means messenger. He was the final messenger who predicted the coming of God's ultimate messenger, Jesus. And I hope after that item we just saw, you'll even be able to remember some of those things. I was helped by that. Just think back to who was batting with a hammer. Okay, we can look at the timeline of the Israelites. Have you ever noticed that if you go through the 12 minor prophets, the order we have them in, it goes back and forth from Israel to Judah. It goes, Hosea is in Israel, Joel is in Judah, Amos is in Israel, Obadiah is in Judah, Jonah is coming from Israel to Nineveh, Micah is in Judah, Nineveh is back to Israel, and then Israel falls, everything else then, Habakkuk and Zephaniah are both about Judah, because there's no Israel left. And then after the exile, everything is united. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are about that united kingdom. You can also think about who else is being talked about in this. You know, Hosea talks about preaching to Egypt. Joel talks about their neighbors. Israel, uh, Amos talks about Israel's neighbors. Obadiah is focused on Edom. Jonah is going to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Micah talks about Israel's neighbors. Nahum talks about Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, again. Habakkuk is asking God, what about Babylon? Are you going to judge them? Zephaniah talks about Israel's neighbors. Um, and Zechariah and Malachi, after the exile, also talk about Israel's neighbors. And it ends with Edom, back at the, which happened early also. You can also think about when these happened. Would you go one slide forward? I'm going to ask you to go back again in a minute. If you have a printed copy of this, you can see the sides more easily of who is on which side, Israel or Judah, and you see that they, the prophets come in clusters. The early prophets were Joel and Obadiah, and they were in Judah. Then you had this large grouping of prophets right before Israel was destroyed, and they were um, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, and Nahum. And then you had a, a grouping of prophets that prophesied right before Judah fell, and they are Micah, Habakkuk, uh, and Zephaniah. And then after the exile, there's three books that happen after the exile, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And fortunately, those ones are at the end of the prophets, so we can think of them together. Can you go back one slide one more time, please? You can also think about the topics of these books. We'll look at that in a moment. But if you read these books, there's also links between them. So it's going back and forth between the two kingdoms. But then there's some topics that go through them, like Joel talks about an earthquake. Amos talks about an earthquake and ends with talking about Edom. Obadiah starts by talking about Edom, ends with talking about the nations. 
Jonah then shows up and goes and preached to the nations and ends with talking about how God is slow to anger. And Micah and Nahum also continue that theme. Jonah's mad that God is slow to anger. Nahum and Micah are happy that God is slow to anger. Now, the way the New Testament uses these books is also interesting. In the Gospels, Hosea is used as the example of God forgiving sinners. Matthew, especially the tax collector, picked up on that. Joel is used at Pentecost in Acts, talking about the Holy Spirit coming and how God's salvation is available to all nations. Amos, likewise, is used in Acts, talking about how God's salvation is for all nations. Even the fact that these prophets were talking about other nations around them, the New Testament picks up to say God is fulfilling his promise to save not only his people, but the people around. And then Obadiah is echoed in Revelation, Paul's letters, and Peter's letters about the final judgment, the day of the Lord. Anytime you hear a New Testament author talk about the day of the Lord, they're probably using Obadiah's term for judgment day. And you know how many New Testament authors talk about the day of the Lord? All of them. Okay? Jonah is used in the Gospels talking about Jesus' resurrection. Just like Jonah got swallowed by that big fish and came back three days later, Jesus looked like God's messenger was done for and he came back three days later. Micah is only used in Matthew at Christmas time, again, to show that Jesus is born uh, in Bethlehem. That's not the only way he's quoted, but that's the, what he's most famous for. Nahum is used in the book of Romans, again, to show that God's salvation is for all nations. Habakkuk is used in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. The argument that we are saved by faith is actually Habakkuk's argument. Zephaniah is used in Revelation the final judgment coming on the whole world, but also the whole world getting in on God's salvation by faith. Haggai is used throughout the Gospels, Hebrews, and Peter, talking about the final judgment and the new temple, God living in us and with us. Haggai and Zechariah were rebuilding the temple and start talking about God's spirit living in us and with us. Zechariah, likewise, Parallels Haggai in a lot of ways, but the Gospels use Zechariah about Jesus' death. And in Revelation, if you read Zechariah with, uh, in one hand and Revelation in the other, you may not understand either of them, but you'll see how they're parallel to each other. Malachi, the Gospels use about John the Baptist, God's messenger, leading to Jesus, God's ultimate messenger. And Jesus' conversation about marriage is echoing Malachi where it says that God hates divorce. Okay, so let's go back and look at the topics. And sorry about the order, you can go past the timeline. Here are the topics, or sorry, not the topics, the fulfillment. All right, here's the question. When are the minor prophets talking about? The day of the Lord is what the minor prophets are talking about. And the day of the Lord comes in both judgment and salvation. The day of the Lord is the Bible's most common way to talk about the final judgment day. You ever heard someone talk about judgment day? The Bible usually calls that the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord coming in judgment also refers to the events of the exile and return. The day of the Lord came upon Israel and Judah and Babylon and Nineveh when God came to judge them. And the day of the Lord coming in salvation also refers to when Jesus came and when the Holy Spirit came. And the day of the Lord comes early for people and nations in both judgment and salvation. Whenever nations fall or people die, judgment day comes early for them. And whenever people put their faith in Jesus, the day of salvation comes early for them. Hebrews says today is the day of salvation. It's another way of talking about the day of the Lord. And God's people struggled right in the Old Testament to understand why the Messiah did not come right when the exile ended. You can see Daniel struggling with this. Wait, I thought this was going to be it. You can see Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi going, wait, 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 we're back from exile, but we didn't, like the king didn't come. What's going on? Okay. 
there's an already and not yet about God's fulfillment here. It's a, it's a helpful way to talk about the last days. Hosea uses this phrase, the last days, in Hosea 3. The question is, where, when were, are, or will the minor prophets be fulfilled? And the answer is the past, the present, and the future. In the past, the exile and return really did literally fulfill uh, the minor prophets. Also, Jesus and the Holy Spirit coming literally fulfilled the minor prophets. And in the present, our life that we have in Christ by the Spirit, available to all nations, is fulfilling the minor prophets. And in the future, there will be judgment and salvation on the day of the Lord for all people. So don't miss out on the past, the present, or the future that God has for us in Jesus. Minor pro- the minor prophets are talking about all of those things. Okay? In the past, the New Testament tells us that God's Old Testament promises are already fulfilled in Jesus. And accepting that the whole Old Testament is about Jesus is what makes us messianic or Christians. That's the word for us as believers. We believe Jesus is the Messiah who fulfills the Old Testament. And Jesus makes general statements throughout the New Testament to say that the whole Bible is fulfilled in Jesus. But if you look at the specific quotes of the minor prophets, they show that Jesus fulfills the minor prophets too. And this school year, we not only had sermons about each of the 12 minor prophets, but we had sermons about how the New Testament uses each of the 12 minor prophets. And the main way, the primary way that the New Testament uses the minor prophets is to argue that they are already fulfilled in Jesus. So let's not miss out on celebrating what Jesus has already done for us. But not everything is over yet. We're still looking to the future. God's people have always wanted to know when the Lord will come. In other words, when the day of the Lord will come. That's what the day of the Lord is. It's when God comes. It's right for us to desire the Lord Jesus Christ to come and save us. In Haggai, it says the desire of all nations will come. In Malachi, it says the messenger you desire will come. It's right for us to to desire that God and his Christ will come to judge and make all things right. In fact, you can hear throughout the Minor Prophets and the New Testament people asking this question. It is right and good for us to ask this question. Have you wanted to ask this question? If so, ask God this question. Here's the question from Habakkuk. How long must this go on? That was before the exile, asking for God to judge. But then when they got back, the question was, how long will you withhold mercy? And the disciples, right before Jesus went back to heaven, asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And then even after the ascension, the book of Revelation has people in heaven asking this question, how long, sovereign Lord? Do you ever want to ask this question? You can. Ask God this question. Remember that the Old Testament chronologically ended with Malachi, and it said, he will turn their hearts, or else he will come and strike the land with a curse. They were looking for God to come. And the end of the New Testament says this, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And then Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's how the New Testament ends. Don't give up looking forward to what God still has for st- in store for us in Jesus. He's coming back again. Do you notice what time period I skipped? Was the present. Because actually, that's not the last verse of the Old Testament. That's the second, I mean the New Testament. That's the second to the last verse of the New Testament. 
See, we should not forget that according to the New Testament, Jesus has already fulfilled the minor prophets for us. The very last verse of the New Testament says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. We already have God's grace in the Lord Jesus by his Holy Spirit now. There is something presently for us to celebrate. Jesus has come. He is still with us by his Spirit, and he will return. All three of those things are true and are the way that the New Testament uses the minor prophets. In Jesus, we get the salvation from the end now. We get in on the day of the Lord now. We get salvation in Jesus now already. In Jesus, we already have all of the blessings promised us on the day of the Lord. They're yours. Okay? Here are the topics covered in the Minor Prophets. God's covenant being like marriage. The day of the Lord. Judgment and salvation. The exile and the return from the exile. God's mercy and forgiveness. Israel and Judah and all nations. The coming of Christ and the Holy Spirit are both foretold in the Minor Prophets. And salvation being by faith, and God's word coming through God's messengers. Did you notice that in our worship text? That they rejected God by rejecting God's messengers. And ultimately, Jesus is God's ultimate messenger and message. And that's what we are in danger of missing out on if we don't see Jesus in the Minor Prophets. I picked out a key verse or a couple of key verses from each of the Minor Prophets. Watch for those topics and think about time frame, past, present, and future, and think about Jesus fulfilling these as we read them. First of all, Hosea from chapter 6 and 14, talking about God's love and mercy in contrast to our fleeting love for God. Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. That's God describing our love. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. But here's God's love. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Isn't that interesting? Our love is like dew because it evaporates. God's love is like dew because it makes us grow. Joel Chapter 2 talks about God's spirit and salvation being for all people on the day of the Lord. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will show wonders in the heaven and on the earth before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter says we're already in that form of the day of the Lord where we can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Where all nations can have God's spirit and it's happening after the exile, but before Jesus returns. Obadiah talks about the day of the Lord's justice and deliverance. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. Here's what it means. It's justice. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. You see the difference? We want God's justice, right? For other people. But you know what? If we get everything that we've done poured back on our own head, we are in big trouble. We need deliverance. And deliverance, God's judgment is coming on all nations. And deliverance is coming out of Mount Zion, out of Israel. Jesus is coming out of Israel to offer this deliverance for the whole world. Otherwise, when Jesus returns, all we will get is perfect justice Everything we've done returned back on our own head. I don't want that. And I don't want that for you. And I don't want that for anyone. Neither does God. Jonah, God's mercy on all people. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of Sheol, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. Jonah is praying when he was the one who was as good as dead, God rescued him. And then after he preaches successfully to the Ninevites, he says, 
It says, he prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah liked it when God's salvation came to him for disobeying. He was a little bugged when God's salvation came to others. A moment ago, I said, I don't want this for, for you or for me or for anyone, but can we be honest for a minute? I think a lot of times we do want God's justice to come on others and them not to get out of it. It's a good thing that God is the one who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and forgiving. Micah talks about God's ruler, his just law, and his merciful forgiveness. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. It's a way of talking about the Messiah coming and telling us he's always been here. In other words, that's a way of talking about Jesus being God. Micah also says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's all God is. He's just, he's merciful, so humble yourself under him. There's only one problem. We don't do that. We haven't done that. So Micah reflects at the end of his book, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. God's going to get rid of our sins, but he's found a way to get rid of our sin without getting rid of us in Jesus. Nahum is good news for those who trust in God. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news. This is echoed in Paul's writings in Romans that say these two things. Those who trust in God will be saved, and God is sending messengers to take this message to all nations. Habakkuk is joined with this in Romans. I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe even if you were told. Here's the problem. Righteousness comes by faith, but we don't believe that. Habakkuk continues, Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. We hear about what God has promised and we say, I don't think God's going to do that. But those who get God's righteousness are those who say, I trust that God has done this in Jesus. He is giving it to me now and he will return to make all things right. It's one of the reasons why I enjoy saying the creed as part of a worship service is a reminder of what God has done, is doing presently and will do for us in the future. Zephaniah. We sing to God since God sings over us. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do you ever think about that? We sing praise songs to God. This says God is singing the song first, rejoicing in his saving us. We sing in response to him, singing because of how excited he is that he's saved us. Haggai talks about how God promises to be with us by his spirit, even as he shakes the heavens and the earth. Haggai says, but now be strong, O Zerubbabel. O Joshua, the high priest, and all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. God's always promised to be with his people by his spirit. He did it 
in the pillar in the wilderness. He did it with his presence in the temple. He did it with sending Jesus to be with us. He's doing it by his Holy Spirit living in us as his temple. And Revelation says when he returns, there won't be a need of a temple because he'll just be right here with us. Zechariah, God's spirit will come through his rejected shepherd. I will pour on on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, a fountain will be opened in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day, I will remove the spirit of impurity from the land. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. That section of Zechariah is quoted in the Gospels about Jesus dying for us. He's done that. He opened a fountain that cleanses us. The shepherd has been struck. The sheep were scattered, and he did it in order to save us. We look on the one whom we pierced. We like to blame others for rejecting Jesus. They had an opportunity to reject him in a different way than we've had opportunities to reject him. But we're the reason that Jesus came to die for sin, all of it, including ours. And yet, we get to say, they are my people, and more importantly, God says they're mine. In Jesus, we're his sheep. He's the shepherd we rejected, and yet... He's the shepherd who accepts us, cleanses us, brings us back. Malachi says that God's messenger will come before the day of the Lord. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Surely the day of the Lord is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble on that day that is coming, and it will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse." Again, I think it's very significant that the Old Testament ends looking forward to God coming, but there's a risk in God coming. And the New Testament ends with this promise that Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord is both the day of God's judgment and the day of salvation. And yet, today is the day of salvation we can get in on early because Jesus has come. The minor prophets and the major prophets contain bookends highlighting the theme of God's relationship to us as a marriage. It ends with God's, oh, sorry, with Israel's unfaithful love for each other. In Malachi, the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as his God's as his garment, says the Lord Almighty. That's the closing bookend in contrast to how God loves us from Hosea 3. The Lord said to Hosea, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. After the Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Here's what I'd like you to remember. That Jesus fulfills the minor prophets for you. See, this is all very interesting. If this only applies to people in other times and other places, but not to us, we can say, huh, interesting. 
but it doesn't do us much good unless we are the ones who have sinned and we are the ones that Jesus came to die for, to save us from God's wrath. Unless this is for you, it doesn't do anything good for you. But you know what? It is for you. You see, in Hosea, we can see that in Jesus, you have God's mercy and forgiveness. He accepts you back. In Jesus, from Joel, we see that you have God's spirit and God's salvation by calling on his name. From Amos, we see that in Jesus, the exile is over. David's tent, his house, is restored, and all nations are welcomed in. From Obadiah, we see that in Jesus, deliverance from Mount Zion has come to all nations. From Jonah, we see that in Jesus, you are saved from death whether you are one of God's people, Israel, or a Gentile. Jonah and the Ninevites were saved from death in the book by God's mercy. And Jesus died, and God saved him from death, and therefore he saves us. He can get us out. God knows the way out of the grave. He's unlocked the door from the inside. He can get you out. Jesus has taken your sin and given you life. From Micah, we see that in Jesus, the Christ, the King, has come. He kept God's law perfectly, and he mercifully forgives you. From Nahum, we see that in Jesus, the good news comes to all nations, and that God is a refuge to all those who trust in him. From Habakkuk, we see that in Jesus, you have God's righteousness by faith in his promises. From Zephaniah, we see that in Jesus, God sings over you and over your salvation, and he invites you to sing with him, celebrating your salvation. In Haggai, we see that in Jesus, God lives in you by his spirit as his temple, and that his temple won't be shaken even when the heavens and the earth are shaken at his return, when he comes. And in Zechariah, we see that in Jesus, your shepherd has died for you, and he's cleansed you by his spirit. And from Malachi, we see that in Jesus, God's messenger has come, and he's turned your heart, changed it, in order to save you from his judgment. The day of the Lord came when Jesus came to earth, and the day of the Lord continues because Jesus is still with us by his Spirit on earth. And the day of the Lord will come when Jesus returns to make all things right. Remember from the minor prophets that you are forgiven and saved in Jesus, past, present, and future. Trust him. This is his promise to you. And this is the good news of the minor prophets for you.